The scripture I'm going to read this morning comes from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 11. And I'm going to start at verse 32, but I want to kind of share with you the story up to this point. This actually passage starts at verse 1. It's a, a story that you may at least be familiar with it called uh, the story of Lazarus. And uh, Lazarus was a friend of Jesus, and he had a couple of sisters, Mary and Martha, uh, that were also close to Jesus. And while Jesus was in ministry, he was out on the east side of the Jordan River um, being in ministry when he got word that Lazarus had become deathly ill. And uh, Jesus still had some ministry to do, and he stayed there for a couple more days. And then he finally started to come back to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which was about a day's journey from where Jesus was. And, and by the time he got there, of course, Lazarus had died. And so we're going to start reading um, at verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind, blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. This is the word of God for us this morning. We are finishing a message series. This is our fourth week in the message series of God Never Said. And we were looking at uh, phrases or uh, sayings or ideas that Christians have often used thinking that God said them. And uh, we think maybe they're in the Bible or that God's spoken them, and so uh, we use them. But as we look closely at these, we've found that God never said a lot of these things that uh, well-meaning Christians say. And so it's important for us to look at what God really says and then how we can respond uh, in each of those situations in a, in a way that is more connected with God's way of working in this world. Uh, the first saying that we said God never said was that God will never give you more than you can handle. Uh, you probably heard someone say that once or twice. God will never give you more than you can handle. God never said that. Um, God did not say we wouldn't have things we can handle. Uh, matter of fact, we, we all will have things that we can't handle. That's the reality of it. And as you read through the Bible, there are person after person who had things they could not handle on their own. And what we're reminded is when we can't handle things that come up, that we are to turn to God and we are to turn to one another. And that with the help of a community and, and, and with God around us, uh, we can handle things better. Not on our own strength, but because other people are there to help strengthen us. Uh, and so that was the first one that we looked at. The second one wasn't so much a saying, but a way of life. And, and that falsehood was that God wants you happy. Uh, a lot of people go through life thinking, God wants me happy, and so I'll do whatever it takes to make me happy, and that's what God wants to do. And so as we live that way, uh, we start to do some things that are wrong, but we say, well, it's okay that I do it because it makes me happy. And so we justify or ignore the wrong things we do uh, because we're pursuing happiness. Uh, God never said he wants you happy, and I believe God's concerned with more than your happiness. He's concerned with your holiness. Uh, how you reflect his image in this world. And, and God wants to be present with you and bring you more than happiness, actually. He wants to bring you joy, which goes much deeper and lasts much longer than just happiness, which goes away after a short amount of time. And so God never said he wants you happy. Uh, last week we looked at um, the idea, is, uh, is God fair? And uh, God never said that he would be fair. God never said that life was fair. And so fair things don't always happen, especially from our perspective. There's a lot of things that look unfair around us. And I reminded us as Christians, there may be two responses to unfairness or injustice in the world. Sometimes we just need to, to push through it. Sometimes things that aren't fair happen, and we just need to move on. Uh, other times, um, we might need to call out that injustice and, and let people know this is not the right way uh, to treat somebody or the right way to go about something. If it's unfair, uh, there may be a justice issue that we need to, as Christians, call out and, and work towards. But even when things are unfair, God is faithful. 
And God sticks with us uh, through all the unfair things that we will go through in life. And so we've looked at a few of these. I've had a few folks ask me if I'm going to do this again, uh, look at some other sayings that Christians say that probably uh, we should leave uh, behind us and not use anymore. And maybe if you have a few of those, feel free to let me know, and and we might do this another time. Uh, This morning, we're going to look at a phrase that um, a lot of well-meaning Christians use. A lot of times this one is used when uh, something happens that we can't make sense of. You know, we want to make sense of it. We want to understand it, um, but it just doesn't seem to make sense to us. And so we use this phrase. Uh, A lot of time with accidents or injuries, we might use this phrase. Or if uh, like someone wants a job, they're trying for a job and it doesn't happen, uh, we might use this phrase. Uh, Unfortunately, even when uh, someone loses a loved one, we we might use this phrase. And um, it's a phrase that's personal to me. I still remember uh, the time it was used on me and the reason that I don't ever use this phrase, uh, unless I'm joking or being sarcastic. Uh, I I don't think I've seriously said this phrase since high school uh, when a friend used it with me. Uh, We were talking or arguing, you know, something like that, about the power of God. And and I was trying to share with my friend that I believe, you know, God is all-powerful, God's in control, but God has given us free will, that we have the ability to choose between right and wrong, the ability to choose God's way or another way. And so we have responsibility to make the right choices in life uh, because there are consequences to the wrong choices that we might make. And my friend was on the other side, and he said, you know, it seems like we have responsibility, but God really is in control of all things. Uh, God makes everything happen. And then he said to me, everything happens for a reason. And that's the phrase we're going to look at. Everything happens for a reason. And the, the thing he started to argue with me is he said, you know, God wanted your parents to get divorced. That was part of God's plan. God wanted that to happen. God caused that to happen. And inside, I just shuddered at that. I, I, I just didn't, couldn't believe that this God that I thought loved me and cared for me would cause the, the most difficult thing that I've had to go through in my life, that would cause uh, me to grow up without a father uh, near to me. And I thought, why would God do that? If God loved me and cared for me, why would God purposefully try to hurt me and harm me in this way? And so he and I never did see eye to eye on uh, God's control and, and how God worked, but I will never believe that everything happens for a reason. I believe some things happen for a reason. I believe some things happen uh, with great reason, but I believe other things just happen uh, because this is the way the world works. I believe that God has given humanity free will to to choose uh, right and wrong, and and unfortunately, humanity, we can choose some pretty evil things, and we've done some very hurtful things as we've chosen to go away from God's way, and so there are consequences to those things, and so there's not a reason God didn't make that happen uh, except for that we have chosen to go astray and go our own direction. But then also, there are natural disasters, and I don't believe that God causes those things to happen either. Uh, A lot of them happen because that's the way our world works. You know, the earthquake in Nepal, God didn't choose for that to happen. Uh, The earth has to shift from time to time, or it will overheat. And so there's a reason that it's, it's shifting and making those, and there's destructive consequences to it, but that's part of how this world works. For it to be inhabitable, it has to have those shifts from time to time uh, so that it doesn't overheat. And so again, God's not choosing to make that happen. He didn't reason for 7,000 people to die, but it happens, and, and God needs to respond. So I don't believe everything, if we say everything happens for a reason, then God cho- chose to cause that earthquake. If everything happened for a reason, then God is picking and choosing who gets cancer and who doesn't. If God is picking and choosing and everything is happening for a reason, then God causes some people to commit suicide. Uh, Everything that's evil and bad in this world, God is causing to happen if everything has a reason and God is making everything happen. And I just don't believe that. Uh, I believe that God has uh, put this world in motion and given us that free will. And so some bad things happen. Uh, Suffering comes to all of us, uh, but it's not because God has caused it, but God works in the midst of those times. And one of the reasons I I believe this is from this passage that we're going to look at this morning, uh, from the Gospel of John chapter 11. Um, As I said, the story of Lazarus, a a good friend of Jesus uh, who got deathly ill, and and Jesus heard about that, but he had some ministry to do. And when he came back, um, Lazarus had already died. And so he came to Lazarus' sister Mary and Martha, and, and they were upset that Jesus hadn't been there to heal him before he had died. Uh, But Jesus said, well, let's go to the tomb. Let's go and and let me see where he has been laid to rest. And as as they start going, uh, there's a powerful verse in here. It's actually a great memory verse, if you guys are into memorizing scripture, because of the shortest verse in the Bible. Uh, John 11.35 said, Jesus wept. That's it. John 11.35, 
Jesus wept. And, and it's a, a powerful little verse um, because my question is, why would Jesus be crying if everything happens for a reason? If everything happens for a reason, Jesus, the Son of God, would know that, right? If that's true, he would know that everything happens for a reason. And so Lazarus has died. Well, there's a reason for that. So why get emotional about it, you know? Why cry about something that has a reason, it has a purpose for happening? Uh, the Son of God would not waste his time crying over something that he knew was going to, to lead to something else. Uh, he wouldn't have, have done that, I don't think. I think he would have said, oh, everything happens for a reason, so let's go on over to the tomb and, and we'll take care of things. But it says Jesus wept. And, and twice there it said he was deeply moved by those he was around. And I think the reason Jesus is crying is not because he's playing along or that's what you're supposed to do, but I think... He's crying because he's lost a friend. This friend that was very close to him, Lazarus, has died. And, and that's our response, is to weep, to be sad, to, to mourn the loss of that relationship. And that's what Jesus is doing. And so I think he, he's showing us that not everything happens for a reason, that there are some difficult things that happen in this life. And, and our normal response isn't, doesn't have to be find the reason behind it, but our response is to... to connect with our emotions, to weep with those who weep, to mourn with those who mourn, to recognize that these things happen and we can be frustrated, we can be angry. It's okay, that's our natural response. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's responding naturally. And I think when we tell someone, well, everything happens for a reason, we're saying you're responding the wrong way. We're saying there's a reason to this, so you don't have to be sad. You don't have to be mad. There's, there's something that's going to come. There's a reason behind it. And I don't think that's what Jesus would want us to do. I think he would want us to do as he did, to, to cry with those that are, are weeping, to mourn with those who are mourning, to be frustrated with those that are frustrated at the things going on in their lives, not to try and ignore it, not to try and push it aside, not say there's a reason that it's happening, but to say, yeah, this is not good. This is terrible, and, and I want to be with you in the midst of these emotions. I want to connect with you uh, because this is our natural response when difficult things happen. And so I, I want us to uh, be encouraged not to say, well, everything happens for a reason, which kind of dismisses our emotions, but to say, yeah, this is terrible, and, and I want to encourage you in this time. Let's pray together, or uh, how can I help? Just to be there with that person in the midst of their sorrow. And so that's where Jesus started, but he also then uh, moved on. And I think as Christians, uh, we need to connect with our emotions, not push them aside or ignore them. But then we also need to hold on to hope uh, that something um, might be coming that God is planning. And as Jesus then went to the tomb uh, and told them to, to roll away the stone and then called out Lazarus, uh, Lazarus comes out with all his grave clothes on and he's alive again. And I don't think Jesus knew he was going to do this, um, because why else? Why would he weep if he knew he was going to do this? But God led him and, and began to speak to him, and he brought hope in the midst of hopelessness. And I believe that that's what God does as well when we face difficult times, and we're facing suffering and sorrow, uh, that God works for the good. And this is another great verse, uh, Romans 8, 28, that Sonia brought for the, the kids. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. So God is working for good. I don't think it would be worded quite like that if God causes evil and then brings good about, you know, if everything has a reason for happening, but it says God is working for good. So even in the midst of evil or bad things, God begins to work for good to come from it. He didn't cause the evil so that he could bring the good and teach us a lesson or, or show us anything, but God says when there are difficult things that happen, I want to work for the good things to come from that. And so we have a reason to hope uh, that there can be resurrection. Now, we can't hope for resurrection like Lazarus had it in this life, uh, but we do hope for that resurrection where we'll be gathered into God's family and his kingdom up in heaven again. But there are other times that we look for the good and, and hold on and have a reason for hope. For me personally, with the divorce of my parents, as I said, one of the most difficult things I went through, but now I have the opportunity to connect uh, with boys, especially in our youth group, that have divorced parents. I can say to them, I know what you're going through. I've, I've been there, and there is hope. God will meet you in the midst of that and, and can lead you to good things. So hold on to that hope. So I can offer that. I don't think that was why my parents got divorced. I thought it was bad choices back then. Uh, but God can bring good from the difficult things we face. Uh, another great um, 
an exciting thing for me that I think is, is coming as from uh, Jennifer Miller and her family. Jennifer, one of our members, uh, died of cancer this year, uh, way too young. And um, one of the things that Jennifer loved were, were children and, and teaching children and, and reaching children. And uh, with her death, she wanted her memorial funds to go to bless children. And some of it went to Mary Welsh School and some of it was given to the church. I uh, was gonna go towards our vacation Bible school because Jennifer helped with that and she wanted it to be something special. And so as uh, we've talked with her family, um, the memorial funds have come in and normally we charge a registration fee for our kids to come to vacation Bible school. It gets expensive, over 100 kids coming for snacks every day and crafts every day and all the supplies and all those kind of things. And so we had a registration fee, but because of Jennifer's memorial this year, there's gonna be no registration fee. Uh, any and all kids can come and participate in our Vacation Bible School um, because she wanted to make sure that everyone was able to come and enjoy it. And my hope is it's the biggest and best uh, Vacation Bible School that we've ever had um, because I know that Jennifer will be smiling upon us and, and that these kids can just know um, that she was caring about them. Uh, even in that difficult, hard situation her family's going through, uh, they're able to bring about some hope and some good uh, through the gifts given for, for Jennifer's memorial. And so I believe God continues to take uh, the difficult and, and the hard times we have, and he wants to bring about good. He wants to give us a reason to hope and a reason to continue on and, and to know that good things can come even in the midst of our difficulties. And, and one of the underlying things in this uh, series that we've been talking about is uh, suffering. And, and I think that some Christians think, well, I shouldn't suffer because God loves me, Right. If I'm in God's family and, and God really cares about me, then I shouldn't have to suffer. I shouldn't have to face any difficulties. And I don't know if we would say it that way, but I think sometimes we, we feel that way. Um, but God never said we wouldn't suffer. And actually, Jesus said, you will suffer if you follow me. And so I don't want us to think that we won't suffer, but I want us to, to recognize that that suffering can lead uh, to some good things. Uh, Timothy Keller, a great author, he said that Jesus didn't come, Jesus didn't suffer so that you won't suffer. So he didn't suffer so that we would never have to suffer. That's not what he did. But Jesus suffered so that when you suffer, you become more like him. When you suffer, you become more like him. Because he suffered up on the cross. He suffered as he was beaten and, and as he was betrayed. Jesus suffered. And he didn't suffer so that we would never suffer, but he suffered so that when we do suffer, we become more like him. And we reflect more of the image of God because he endured that suffering. And that suffering led to hope, led to the hope uh, of new life for each and every one of us. And so God will, will work in the suffering that we experience. That doesn't mean it happened for a reason necessarily, but God can work for good to come from all the difficulties that we face in this life. And so we're called to remember and to have a reason of hope uh, when we face suffering, when we face difficulties, because God will be working for good in each of us. Uh, let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that in the midst of our suffering or our pain or our difficulty, you can give us a reason to hope. Lord, we know that not all things happen for a reason, but we know that you can work for good in anything that happens. Help us to keep our eyes focused on, on the reason for hope that we have, and that is you, Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank you for your life, your death, and your resurrection. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.